good morning, everybody. And I'm pleased to be able to come up on a beautiful winter's day. Uh, if you saw my Dharma talk title, I, I'm again covering more of uh, Dogen Zenji's writings. And uh, today, I'm actually doing a two part. Um, I'm presenting the, his instruction, the six sections of what's called the Bindo Wa. And that means the endeavor of the way, written in 1231, which is pretty early for Dogen, as far as writings. And he says, it's by Dogen who has transmitted Dharma from Song, China. So it's interesting that in his subtitle, he is throwing out his basis of authority. And uh, the, the title, Endeavor the Way, the way is, of course, realization. But I think it's an interesting choice of words. And it, it gets right back to his, the answer to his spiritual question. It's going to take practice. It takes actual effort. <laughs> it's not something that's going to, you know, bonk you on the head or it's not like the lottery. You know, you have to actually uh, be having some practice. And so this is really an important um, part of uh, Dogen Zinji's. And you'll see he sets out themes that that will echo in some of the other uh, Dogen talks uh, or Dogen writings that I've talked about. Uh, this happens to be trans translated by Lou Richmond and Kazakai Tanahashi. I don't know uh, Mr. Tanahashi, but Lou Richmond, of course, was in our spot training program and a very well-respected uh, uh, Soto Zen teacher. Uh, so we're continuing this talk about Dogen's instructions in writing, and there's three critical points that Dogen's, the entire work uh, points out, uh, critical point, practice points. First of all, that Zazen is the only practice necessary and sufficient for realization. Second of all, and I mentioned this in other talks, his concept of practice enlightenment, those two words hyphenated together in one phrase. And the, the specific way I describe that is very important because to him it's not two things. It's smooshed together. And then he touches on in, in this part of the talk uh, that distinction between monastics and us lay practitioners is irrelevant to realization. So this first talk, I cover his pure instruction part, which is in the front part of Bindo Wa. And uh, uh, I'll cover these important uh, topics uh, in a later talk at some other point, if, when I'm invited, if uh, I will cover how he amplifies those in a question and answer format, which again is, is uh, very much what he would, would have been exposed to in China. So um, the first section starts off, all Buddha Tathagatas who directly transmit inconceivable Dharma and actualize supreme perfect enlightenment have a wondrous way, which he means a practice, a method, Unsurpassed and unconditioned, only Buddhas transmit it to Buddhas without veering off. That's another important point he's making as far as Zazen. And he says, self-fulfilling samadhi is its standard. So it's not merely just sitting, but it is actually sitting in samadhi is what he's talking about. And then he finishes this with Sitting up upright, practicing Zen, which he means Zazen, is the authentic gate to the unconfined realm of this Samadhi. So he's presupposing that you are sitting with Samadhi, not daydreaming and so on. Uh, and then he <coughs> basically is answering his spiritual question, which I mentioned many times before, Although this inconceivable dharma is abundant in each of us, it is not actualized without practice, and it is not experienced without realization. 
When you release it, it fills your hand. How could it be limited to one or many? When you speak it, it fills your mouth. It is not bounded by length or width. And then he says, all Buddhists continuously abide in it, but leave, do not leave traces of consciousness in their illumination. That's thoughts. And if you recall, I've mentioned that before in Yuibutsu Yobutsu, another writing of his. So it's not about thoughts. He says, uh, now, that's Buddhas. He says, or sentient beings, which we must take as ordinary people, continuously move about in this, but illumination is not manifest in their consciousness. In other words, that they're not realizing it, that they're not getting it. And then he says, the concentrated endeavor of the way. So it's not just casual, you know, let's put on some new age music. This is not a yoga place. Concentrated endeavor of the way I'm speaking of allows all things to come forth in enlightenment and practice, all inclusiveness with detachment. And then he says, pass that he quotes uh, an ancient uh, scripture, passing through the barrier and dropping off the limitations, how could you be hindered by nodes in bamboo or knots in wood? And of course, that's a poetic way of saying all your thoughts, your thoughts, your perceptions, your emotions, all the, all the jumble stuff that's going to trip you up. And so that pretty clearly, I mean, he's, he's going to say more about it, but that's pretty clear what he's talking about in terms of Zen, the authentic gate. Section two is really a, a way seeking talk. And so it's not very long at all. Basically he says, well, after I had my spiritual question, I visited various teachers in uh, Japan. Uh, then he met priest Myozen at Kinan Monastery. And that was a Rinzai monastery. Uh, and he trained there for nine years. Then he says, uh, and he says, he alone, as a senior disciple of Isai, correctly transmuted the unsurpassable Buddha Dharma. No one can compare to him. I think that's very much different from later sectarian writings where one school is kind of criticizing the other. It's interesting. And then he says, later I went to Great Song, China. Now remember at that time there were different kingdoms and Song would be the southern China. Uh, Beijing, Bei means north. So we're talking about the southern half basically, somewhere in that area. Uh, and he says, I visited masters all up and down this area. And he says, I heard that the teaching of all five schools of Zen. Yes, there used to be five sc schools. And he says, finally, I studied with his master, Rujing of Taibo Peak. And that's, of course, where he was, had his enlightenment experience and was transmitted by him, by that teacher. And then he comes back in uh, 1228 to Japan. And <laughs> he says, uh, in, with the hope of spreading the teaching and saving sentient means, a heavy burden on my shoulders. However, I will put aside the intention of having the teaching prevail everywhere. Uh, he says, I think of wandering about like a cloud or a water weed. Uh, and then he states the problem and why part of his motivation. He says, yet there may be true students of Zen, which is what he's hoping to contact, who are not concerned with fame and gain, money from like chanting funeral sutras, uh, who will, uh, but who allow their thought of enlightenment to guide them. Thoughts, remember, not gonna work, useless. And they may, be, they may be confused by incapable teachers and obstructed from the correct understanding, indulging in smug self-satisfaction, kind of like the Zen know-it-all. Oh yeah, I know that, I know that. Uh, uh, and they may sink into the land of delusion for a long time. So he's concerned about people really going off the, off the rails, as we would say. And then he puts two points. He says, how can they nourish the correct seed of prajna? 
and have the opportunity for realization, of course. And he says, if I'm wandering about people, I'm not always available to people. And because I feel so concerned for him, I'd like to record the standards of Zen monasteries, which I personally saw and heard in great song. Again, he's referring to those authorities, less people think he's some flake, right? Uh, and the, talking about the profound principle that his master transmitted to him. And that's what he wants to leave for the students of the way. And section three is just a brief recounting of the Zen's version of its lineage. So he starts with, uh, of course, the Buddha. He talks about Mahakashapa. Then he talks about Bodhidharma, trend, bringing Zen to uh, China, of course, and his transmission. He talks about the six ancestors' transmission. And then he says, hey, you know, uh, the, six trend, the six ancestor had some very gifted students that he transmitted to, and then those lineages spread, and he says, and later the five gates opened, and then he enumerates them. There was a, a Fayan school of Zen, a Guiyang, the Kadong, which is our Soto Zen, the Yunmin school, lots of, of uh, koans where Yunmin is speaking, and then finally the Linji, which is Rinzai in Japanese. And of course he says uh, of those five uh, uh, in China, it's just the Renzai school. And of course he was bringing uh, the Soto style to Japan. And so he says uh, later in China, though there were all kinds of sutras and teachings coming through, but he says that didn't lead to any conclusive teaching. There was a guy had a lot of scholars, you know, bookish people studying, but he says that, that didn't lead to anything. Uh, too many ideas floating around. I think today of, of, you know, not just books, but a lot of media, you know, I mean, it's easy to pick up something really strange. But he says, when Bodhidharma came from India, you know, that he, he cut all that off. He says, this is the standard. Zazen is the standard. So then section four, he really burrows into Zazen as, and Samadhi as a soul practice. He says, now, all the ancestors who've made true path of enlightenment uh, sat upright. They did zazen, practicing in the midst of self-fulfilling samadhi. So he's always linking those two things. And then he says, uh, those who attain enlightenment in, a in India and China also followed the way. It's done so because the teachers and, and transmitted it and, and did that teaching, taught that technique. And then he emphasizes this is authentic. He says, in the authentic tradition of our teaching, directly transmitted, uh, he said, it is unsurpassable, Sazen with Samadhi. And then he gives a caution. He says, from the first time you meet a master without not engaging in incense offering, bowing, chanting Buddha's name instantly over, you know, incessantly, uh, repentance or reading scriptures. Once you find a master that's not doing all that stuff, you should just wholeheartedly sit with them and thus drop away body and mind. So he's starting to enumerate and he'll do a much more thorough job in the question and answer section, another talk, but, but um, now uh, that might give some of us pause because you're thinking, well, do we chant the Buddha's name? I know it's in the dedication, right? The echo, uh, we do bowing. I mean, not a lot of it. It's not like that's, that's gonna, you know, uh, that's the actual practice. I mean, we spend most of the time sitting, right? But it does kind of make you wonder, I wonder if Soto's, you know, whether they're really sticking to what he said or not. You know, it's, I'll leave it open, but, um, uh, and some temples, uh, you know, may, may do other things. Section five, he's talked a little bit more about the Samadhi he's, and without boundaries. He says, even for a moment, when you express the Buddha's seal by sitting upright in Samadhi, the whole phenomenal world becomes the Buddha's seal and the entire sky 
turns into enlightenment. Because of this, the, all the Buddhas and Buddha Tathagatas increase their Dharma bliss, renewing their magnificence in the awakening of the way. Furthermore, all beings in the ten directions and the six realms, including the three ro- lower realms, at once obtain pure body and mind. Now you think you might think that's pretty fantastic, especially if it's you having this realization. <coughs> but remember that remember the, the Buddha's words of what the words attributed to him in his enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. I and all beings are simultaneously enlightened. I, I think I hear Dogen saying pretty much the same thing. I, I, I hear that is it in accord with what was attributed to the Buddha under the Bodhi tree. So, uh, and he says, at, at that time, all things realize correct awakening, myriad objects partake in the Buddha, Buddha body and sitting upright, king under the Bodhi tree, you immediately leap beyond the boundary of even realization or awakening. So I like what Norman Fisher said one time, it was in relation to his comment on being time, Uji, but he says, you know, a lot of Zen students just don't appreciate that, the, how wonderful the inherent nature is. They ignore or, or don't see their magnificence. But certainly, Dogen's description is pretty expansive, isn't it? It's like kaboom. And then he says, he wraps this section up by saying, because such broad awakening res- resonates back to you and helps you inconceivably, you will in Zazen unmistakably drop away body and mind, cutting off defiled thoughts from the past, realizing Buddha Dharma. And of course, drop, dropping away uh, body and mind is what happened to him in China. With his, with his master who transmitted him. And he, it was actually a monk beside Dogen who was sleeping and the master took off his sandal and said, whack, you know, wake up, drop body and mind. And Dogen sitting next to him like, bam, you know, that was just, that was it. <clears throat> the last section then is a, a little bit more about practice realization. And he says, all of this in practice does not appear within perception. I'm gonna stop and remember, perception is constructed on our minds. That's like thoughts. So that ain't it, is it? It's not there. Because it, Buddha mind, is unconstructed in stillness. It is immediate realization. Now that, he doesn't mean immediate in terms of right now, I want it pronto. He means inter, no intermediating anything, no separation, a oneness. No, no thoughts intermediating, intermediating, no consciousness saying, oh, I'm over here looking at this. If there's immediate. And so he says, if practice and reala- realization were two things, like what ordinary people assume, you could recognize each separately. But he says, but what can be met with recognition, which is our perception, is not realization itself, right? It's a, just a thought. It's an idea. It may be a picture, maybe a visualization. I don't know, you know, humans do all kinds of stuff like that. But he says, that's not it. He says, what can be met with recognition is not realization itself because realization is not reached by a deluded mind. And by that, of course, he means a mind that's spinning thoughts, dialogues, visualizations, rationalizations, you know, the mind is, the mind's a terrible thing. (laughs) So 
<laughs> practice realization means that they are one immediate non-dual practice. And then he says, in stillness, mind and object merge in realization, non-dual, and go beyond enlightenment. You're going, what? No, he means the thought, any of your thoughts about what you imagine enlightenment to be. So he says, nevertheless, because you are in a state of self-fulfilling samadhi without disturbing its quality or moving a particle, without doing anything, in other words, you extend the Buddha's great activity, profound and subtle teaching, just by being, just abiding. He says, grass, trees, and lands, mountains <laughs> for us, which are embraced by this teaching together radiate a great light and endlessly expound the inconceivable profound Dharma. I think of all the lines in Bindawa, that one all reminds me of Uji, of being time. Everything existing in this moment together. Grass, trees, walls, in other words, human buildings, Bring forth the teaching for all beings, common as well as sages. So now he's, what did he just do? He was sneaky. He just opened the door. He says, you don't have to be a scholar or a monastic. He says, you could be a householder. So that's very, it's sort of like a, like a little extra, that thing that he throws in, which then he really develops in the question and answer period. So that includes lay practitioners. I, I'm not sure if he was like cautious because you know a lot of monastics they go they want a real separation between because we're we've given look what we've given up. <laughs> yeah, attachment to monasticism, but it's, it was true. It was true. It, even in today in Japan today, a, a, a nationally recognized Zen master is the one that's still supposedly celibate and monastic. So there's that, def, that hierarchy, right? The hierarchy. But he's, he says it's for, the teaching is for all beings, us commoners, householders, as well as the highfalutin. So, uh, I mean, and that's typical Dogen. He throws these little things in, you know, it's like a little time bomb. It's, it's gonna go off later. You know, it's because when they go think, oh my gosh, that's for his time, that was huge. So he ends this with uh, the realm of the self waking and waking others invariably holds the mark of realization with nothing lacking. And realization itself is manifest, manifest without ceasing for a moment. I'm gonna stop and just ask a couple of rhetorical questions. Do you experience grass and trees bringing forth the teaching, radiating in a great light? Are all things illuminated? But more importantly, as you're practicing, do you ex experience lacking nothing? Lacking nothing. And then he says, the zazen of even one person I might add, even a lay person, <laughs> at one moment imperceptibly accords with all things and fully resonates throughout time. Hmm, there's that time again. Past, present, and future. Each moment of Zazen is equally wholeness of practice, equally wholeness of realization. That's his practice realization concept. Equally there, it's an identity. It's the same thing. And then he concludes and says, this is not only practice while sitting, it's like a hammer striking emptiness before and after its exquisite peel permeates everywhere. How can it be limited to this moment? Hundreds of things, meaning the 10,000 things, all manifest original practice from the original face. It is impossible 
to measure. So in conclusion, that's the six sections. You know, we saw how, you know, uh, the Bendo Wall was sort of a review uh, and kind of uh, establishing his authority to write and his motivation to write this. And again, Zazen is the only practice necessary and sufficient for enlightenment, for realization. All other practices may or may not be helpful. His assertion, I think, cuts through or bypasses a lot of doctrinal arguments. Uh, and if there are other rituals and practices, they're not necessary. They're not primary, I should say. And of course, he opens the door for lay practice. And again, it bears repeating. Samadhi is the standard of Zen practice, of Zazen. If you're not continue, continually inhabiting the present moment, go back to the present moment. Keep remembering to go back to the present moment. So I'll leave you with some thoughts. And then I'll be open for questions. If Zazen is the only practice necessary and sufficient, why do we have rituals or study? Chanting. I think that's a legitimate question, I think. Uh, is monastic life even necessary? You can kind of see where Dogen's going with this question, right. although he ran monasteries, so. Is sutra study ever helpful? And I borrowed this from a bumper sticker. What would Dogen do? Sorry, I, I couldn't resist. <laughs> so we'll, we'll open for, for questions, and uh, I'll take them up for sure in a later talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>